my general role in these conferences appears to be to annoy people. Um, so I'm going to try and avoid doing that. I, one of my Czech students gave me a, a, a proverb which says, speak the truth, but leave immediately after. <laughs> um, now I am going to have to rush off at the end, but that's because I have to catch a flight, not because I'm worried that I may have annoyed people. But um, Anne uh, Marie gave me a very extensive brief here. Uh, and uh, the brief was to give a brief overview of how voluntary and involuntary patients are dealt with under UK legislation and how the deprivation of liberty safeguards are operating in practice. Well, if George could have stayed for a day, I could stay for a week <laughs> talking to you about how our deprivation of liberty safeguards are working because they're, um, it's difficult to describe them as safeguards without risking breach of the Trade Descriptions Act. <laughs> um, the, uh, I would recommend to you um, the website of Lucy Series, who's here in the, in the audience. The, it's called The Small Places, and you should all Google it and put it on your favourites list because it will tell you in a very informed and, and a good critical way how the Mental Capacity Act is operating in the UK. And, you know, we have this idea, we have a lot of kind of binary ideas here which are coming in as a result of uh, debates that are going on in mental health legislation, like capacity legislation good, mental health legislation bad. Um, and capacity legislation, uh, uh, I was talking to Lucy the other day, I'm sorry to embarrass you twice here, Lucy, but, um, and she was saying, you know, what our Mental Capacity Act is often about, it's supposed to be person-centred, it's supposed to be centred on P, who is the statutory name for the person who's alleged to lack capacity. Uh, but what a lot of it is about is disputes about who owns P. You know, is it the family or is it the local authority? Is it the state? Um, and so, you know, we need to be careful when we're, we're um, thinking about this that we don't um, suspend our critical judgment and think that mental capacity legislation is good and mental health legislation is bad, because if I were being detained in England, I'd rather be detained under the Mental Health Act than under the Mental Capacity Act, because people who love me would have a better chance of getting me out. Um, and that's really what, what, uh, what, what's important here. Um, so uh, that's uh, one thing that I, I wanted to sort of get off my chest. Um, I'll tell you how the deprivation of liberty safeguards are working in a, in a, in a moment. Um, briefly make the argument in favour of the positive definition of voluntary <coughs> patients and the extension of procedural and other safeguards to such patients. I'm not sure about the legal definition of voluntary patients taken as terribly far. Um, but what I am sure about is the extension of proper safeguards to such people because nobody is ever voluntary in the mental health system. Indeed, in England and Wales, nobody is ever voluntary in any system because voluntarism is always in the shadow of the possibility of compulsion. I mean, Rory put it so well, he put his first slide up and I thought, God, that's, you know, there it is, prone to the law. In our mental health act, we talk about people being liable to be detained. Once you've been detained and you're sent on leave from hospital, you are liable to be detained. And that means you can be detained without being put on a new section. You can be recalled to hospital. So if we look at how... Uh, involuntary patients are, are, are how, how involuntary patients are, are, are admitted in England and Wales. There's a, a procedure known as sectioning. Your nearest relative can put you into hospital, can apply to put you into hospital, but no nearest relative ever does that in England and Wales, or at least it doesn't look, like, look that way. If you, uh, the way the system operates is that an approved mental health professional will do that. Um, and the reasoning behind 
providing approved mental health professionals is to stop screwing up family relationships by have, setting family member against family member. Now, I gather that a large percentage of admissions, and from what Rory was saying, a large percentage of involuntary admissions here are carried out by family members, by relatives making applications. That seems to me to be, uh, you know, if you're going to keep mental health legislation, and I think, you know, me mental health legislation uh, may be prohibited by Article 14 of the, of the CRPD, but in, I'm not sure in real terms whether we can expect to see its demise anytime soon. Um, I don't, um, uh, I'm not entirely convinced by the argument of delinked risk-based um, legislation, um, but that, that's a, 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 another issue. Um, so that, that's one thing I think that, that, it, that that's important. Once you're, um, so if you're being considered for admission to hospital in the UK, what's going to happen? Somebody's going to come out and see you. That will be an approved mental health professional. It will be uh, two doctors, one of whom is approved as having expertise in psychiatry and diagnosis and treatment of mental disorder. They will come and see you and they will assess um, whether you have a mental disorder which is of a nature or degree warranting detention in hospital and whether detention is necessary for your health or your safety or for the protection of others. And they may well have the police with them. In fact, quite often they will have the police with them. Um, and it may be that you'll be offered a choice. You can come into hospital voluntarily. We think you need to go into hospital or we, uh, yeah. um, would you like to come into hospital? And you say, because you've been here before, you say yes. Because you know what the alternative is. And the alternative is compulsory admission. So, voluntarism <coughs> is in the shadow of compulsion. You get into hospital, you're a voluntary patient, you've agreed to go in. And you're there, you're receiving treatment for your mental disorder, and you think you want to leave. I didn't buy into this, I said I'd go to hospital, but you call this a hospital, it's a sort of place which looks like it was built 30 years ago to, or 100 years ago as a workhouse or something like that. You know, and some of our uh, old hospitals are forbidding environments. And so you say you want to leave. And then under Section 5 of our Mental Health Act, you can be held for 72 hours while people decide whether you ought to be compulsorily admitted. And if that's a doctor can do that, and a doctor can do that even if you're an inpatient receiving treatment for physical disorder. So George's world uh, uh, enables people who are inpatient receiving treatment for physical disorder, if somebody thinks they may have a mental disorder and need to be admitted, they can be held for up to 72 hours while somebody decides whether to apply to admit them. And if there's no doctor there, a nurse can do it for six, up to six hours. So, as long as that nurse is of the prescribed class, and that means you're a registered mental <coughs> health nurse. So, you know, voluntarism in the uh, British system is in the shadow of compulsion all the time. You're a volunteer as long as you agree to be a volunteer, and then, you know, people might think, well, he can go, <coughs> Fennel can go, um, we're fed up with him, and he can walk out, um, uh, and, and I might be able to be allowed to leave, but if anybody thinks I might be a risk to myself or others, they can stop me from leaving by holding me under the holding power. We don't talk about voluntary and involuntary patients. We talk about voluntary and informal patients. 
And we do things in, in exactly the same way as Claire has described you do them in Ireland. You're an informal patient if you're not a detained patient. Why do we call them informal? In 1930, we used to have three groups of patients. We used to have, under our Mental Treatment Act, we used to have voluntary patients, and they had to be able to consent to go into hospital. And then we had uh, people who were certified under the Lunacy Act. Well, God help us if we ever go back to those days. And in the middle, we had these people who were called non-volitional patients. <laughs> Be, uh, yes indeed. Uh, what might a non-volitional patient be, I hear you ask? Well, that means somebody who is incapable of forming a clear volition as to whether they want to stay in the hospital. The Bournewood Gap people, and I'll come to them in, in a minute. So these are people who aren't saying no, but they're not saying yes. But we don't want to put, we don't want to certify them under our lunacy act because that's stigmatizing, and it's also resource intensive. So we call them non-volitional, and they can stay in hospital for six months as a as a person who has to stay in hospital for six months, and then um, if they don't recover their volition within that six months, they have to be certified. Then in 1959, we decide we'll get rid of that because it's not working, and we merge non-volitional and consenting patients into one group, and we call them informal. And then things trundle on from 1959 until 1994, when a patient who's got an, a learning disability, Mr. H.L., is um, living in the community with two carers, Mr. and Mrs. E, who've been looking after him for three years. He becomes disturbed in a day center. He's taken into a psychiatric hospital, and he is kept there. And Mr. and Mrs. E are told not to come and see him, because that might uh, upset him. And Part of the reason might be because if they came and saw him, he would want to go home with them. Um, and if he tried to go home with them, the Mental Health Act code says if somebody's persistently trying to leave hospital, you should detain them under the mental health legislation. So that's what um, that case was about. And that case went all the way to the House of Lords. And our House of Lords said that you could, if somebody lacked capacity, you could detain them if it was in their best interest and you didn't have to follow any of the procedures or give them any of the procedural safeguards in the Mental Health Act. And lots of people, myself included, said, this man was deprived of his liberty <coughs> without due process of law in an arbitrary way contrary to the European Convention on Human Rights, Article 5, which says, if you are going to be deprived of your liberty, the case law clearly establishes that you, there must be objective medical evidence of a true mental disorder given to a competent authority. There must be regular review of that um, need for detention and that mental disorder must be of a kind or degree warranting confinement. Now people talk about a paradigm shift. I'm an old boy. I was there in 1979 in my office uh, when a, a case came through the post to me, that this was in the days before the internet, called Winter Warp in the Netherlands. And I thought, oh, what's this about? And, I, and there's this thing called the European Convention of Human Rights. That was the new paradigm in those days. The paradigm was that the, men, the, the European Convention said, the only way you can detain somebody who hasn't committed a crime yet is if they are a person of unsound mind. And um, so uh, 
the Court of Human Rights in 1979, which was at a time when um, the, in the Soviet Union they were locking up people like Alexander Solzhenitsyn um, because they didn't agree with uh, the regime on grounds of mental disorder. The, the, the European Court said you have to have objective medical evidence of a true mental disorder. You can't preventively detain people merely because of deviancy from society's norms. There has to be objective medical evidence. And we trust, we want doctors to do this. We want them, we believe they've got the kind of ethical code that they won't lock people up um, uh, if, if it's not you know, necessary in some way for their health. And that was what was done. We've now got a paradigm shift where we say this has all got to go. We can't detain people on grounds of mental disorder. This is what Article 14, we're told, is telling us. Now, I have to say something about the uh, UNCRPD, and I'm not going to leave immediately afterwards. I will stay here and listen to what you have to say to me. But when you look at the CRPD, uh, and it says that... Um, detention must be delinked from risk. It doesn't actually say this. The UN High Commissioner for Human Rights says this, and the UN um, Committee for the Rights of Persons with Disabilities says this. And when you actually look at what's happening with the Convention in the UK, which has um, ratified this, and it has ratified the optional protocol, and I'm told, I can't remember who told me this, but the Department of Health didn't look at it, and the Ministry of Justice didn't look at it. The only government department which actually looked at this convention before we ratified it was the Department of Work and Pensions. Um, and they it, it, it sort of put in some kind of little rider to it. Um, but, you know, it's clearly there are ways in which you could argue the UK government doesn't comply with it, and Article 14 is one of them. But what I would say will happen in, in the British system, and it may happen, I don't know what happened enough about I, the Irish legal system to know whether it would happen here, is that our courts, which follow the European Convention on Human Rights and must give effect to convention rights where that is possible, follow the European Convention on Human Rights. They don't follow uh, the CRPD except as an aid to interpreting the Convention on Human Rights, the European Convention. Uh, and so they do that when they think it bolsters their idea of what the European, the Court of Human Rights should mean. So you look at the cases that there have been where the CRPD is mentioned, and the judges will mention the CRPD if it supports their interpretation of Article 5 or whatever it is, uh, and they will say it's a useful aid to interpretation of the Convention. And if, it, if somebody makes an argument based on the CRPD that they don't agree with, they'll say, we're not bound by this. Um, we're bound by the European Convention. So in actually achieving this paradigm shift, we're going to have problems. The, what you sign up to when you sign up to the convention is you, may, you agree that you're, you will not do anything which is incompatible with the convention and you, that you will ad adjust your laws to make them compatible with uh, the convention. So question then, what, what might make it compatible? Now I'm going to say something about these two human rights paradigms, the two approaches. The ECHR allows detention on grounds of unsoundness of mind. The CRPD says that it prohibits it. <coughs> Deprivation of liberty is allowed as long as it is delinked from mental disorder. Now, one of my age-old criticisms of psychiatry has been that it's obsessed with taxonomy. Um, and uh, George will probably want to um, argue with me about this. But what is happening in law is we've become obsessed with taxonomy. We've become obsessed now with one human right in the UK. Yeah. What, a, what 
human rights are affected, what convention rights are affected if you're given treatment for mental disorder without your consent? Article 8, right of respect for your private life. Potentially Article 3, it could be inhuman or degrading treatment. Um, and Article 5, if you're detained, deprivation of liberty. And that's the one we're absolutely obsessed with. Deprivation of liberty. Why is that? Because of Mr. H.L. Where the Court of Human Rights said you can't deprive somebody of their liberty even if they're not resisting unless you follow a procedure prescribed by law. Unless they themselves have the opportunity to challenge their detention either themselves or through a proxy. So, Mr. H.L., who didn't realize that he was being detained, who became distressed, who was in this place, if he tried to leave, he would have been stopped, um, was held by the Court of Human Rights to have been deprived of his liberty. And then um, there was much fluttering in the dove coats. Um, the solids had hit the cooling system in a big way, the department thought, the Department of Health had always thought, well, this will be all right, we can detain these people under common law because they lack capacity and it's in their best interest. And now they've got to have a procedure. So how do we comply with this? If you're a government seeking to comply minimally with a, a judgment of the European Court of Human Rights, you say, right, if we're going to deprive somebody of their liberty, we have to follow a due process prescribed by law. So we don't want to be doing this for anybody who isn't deprived of their liberty, even though some of their other convention rights may be impacted upon quite badly. If they're not deprived of their liberty, we don't want to give them these safeguards. So how will we do this? I know we will say that it is for the place where the person is being held to decide whether they are or are likely to be depriving somebody of their liberty. <coughs> so what's a deprivation of liberty then, is the question. We don't have to do this if we're not depriving somebody of their liberty, but we do have to do it if we are. And Suddenly, deprivation of liberty pops up in loads of different legal contexts, in the anti-terrorism context, in a, a kettling of demonstrators context, and we've suddenly got loads of lawyers in the UK who are massive experts on what's a deprivation of liberty. It's a matter of fact and degree, we're told. It's, it depends on the concrete situation of the individual. Now that is, you know, Rory talked beautifully about grey areas. <laughs> you know, that, that there's a grey area right there. Once you tell a lawyer it's a matter of fact and degree, they go, great. <laughs> We're in here. It's a mixed question of fact and law. Uh, it depends on the type of deprivation, the duration of deprivation, the um, uh, manner of implementation. And so you get lawyers saying, right, well, what do, what do we mean by type? What do we mean by duration? What do we mean by manner of implementation? And, you know, there's a case recently where the court of, our Court of Appeal held that somebody who was detained for 40 minutes in the back of a police van was deprived of his liberty, um, a young and autistic man. Um, but, so, that's what we've decided to do. And because we've decided to do that, we've now got our Supreme Court waiting to consider a case where... Um, a, the, they have to decide whether a person is deprived of his liberty when he is kept in a, a residential setting, which isn't a registered care home, uh, but where he's having to wear a suit which stops him from ingesting his own uh, incontinence wear, and where he would be prevented from leaving if he tried to do so. 
And we've got loads of cases, now two cases in particular, Stanef and, uh, and, um, uh, Stanef and uh, uh, Bulgaria, I think it is, and, and Kedzior in Poland, which say a person is deprived of his liberty if he would be prevented from leaving if he tried to do so. You know, easy enough, easy peasy. But you look at our case law, and our Court of Appeal um, has said that you have to look at the situation the person would be in if they were anywhere. If their disability is depriving them of their liberty because they would need to be subject to these restrictions wherever they were, they're not deprived of their liberty. Now there is a breach of the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability, and it's a breach which we should all deplore. It is that a person is entitled to less protection of the, these safeguards if they have a disability. And that is contrary to Article 14 by anybody's interpretation. You don't have to go to the committee or the UN High Commissioner or anybody like that. It's a breach. It's a clear breach. And if our Supreme Court doesn't say it's a breach, um, I think they will make a grievous mistake um, because this is disability discrimination. And the reason we have this disability discrimination is because we are putting the cart before the horse. We're saying we'll only give you safeguards if you're being deprived of your liberty. And we've made that so technical that you need to be a genius to understand it. Um, and you know, you, it's much more flexible and amorphous than capacity assessments, which in themselves are, are, are amorphous. So, now another binary issue. People tell me uh, that um, you know, guardianship is ipso facto bad. You know, it's, a, it's become a bad word. It's like it's behind you. And to mine. What is a bad form of guardianship is plenary guardianship. And so I agree with what everybody says when they say, if you're going to define what a voluntary patient is, you cannot include in it a person who has been placed in an institution by their guardian. And the European Convention tells you that you can't do this. There's a case called Stukaturov in Russia, where the convention, the, the, the man's mother put, her in, put him in the hospital and only the man's mother could challenge his detention and she didn't want him out. So, you know, if, if you think things couldn't be worse, um, they, are, they were worse there. And, you know, he, he even had bother getting his news to a lawyer that he was in there. Um, so, you know, that isn't allowed. Um, but my argument is that we don't we shouldn't be focusing completely on deprivation of liberty or being an inpatient in an approved center because most places are now trying to move towards community based mental health services and i think if we focus you know there is a, a key human rights issue here in relation to deprivation of liberty but also there's a human rights issue in relation to um, interference with physical integrity, treatment without consent, and so on. But also, there is an, a, a, an equally important human rights issue under the UNCRPD, and that's the right to the highest level, uh, attainable level of health care, which we're in danger of forgetting about. And I was talking this morning about, um, uh, today's St. David's Day, by the way, so happy St. David's happy Day to you all. Um, um, I was talking today about the Welsh Mental Health Measure. There, a person has a statutory right to a care and treatment plan. They have a statutory right to be involved in the drawing up of the care and treatment plan. They have uh, a right to... Uh, tell the authorities, uh, tell the, their care coordinator, as the person is called, um, uh, what they think their relapse signatures are. That means signs that you're getting worse in modern jargon. 
um, and, uh, and that you might need help and support. And, uh, uh, and the treatment plan is supposed to write down what should happen when a person is needing to go back into hospital. That, to me, is what it's about, is person-centeredness, is having a, you know, listening to people. That's what Rory was talking about earlier, is, you know, people say, I want, can you listen to me? I'm telling you this. And in order to get themselves listened to, you know, people in stab vests have to come, um, and so on. I mean, you know, that isn't um, the way that the system should work. And the other aspect, I mean, we talk about risk and all this. In this measure, a person can go and ask for an assessment. If they've been in secondary mental health services for uh, uh, at any time within the last three years, uh, sorry, if, if, if it's three, sorry, if, uh, get this right. If, if, in the three years after they've been discharged from secondary mental health services, they have a right to go and ask for an assessment. There was a case three weeks ago in South London where a lady um, who had killed her mother previously had a diagnosis of borderline personality disorder, turned up at a psychiatric hospital and asked to be helped, asked to be admitted and was turned away and stabbed somebody in the street, killing them. I get phoned up by people um, uh, by, uh, telling me about similar kinds of cases, cases where they have tried to engage with the system, where they've tried to get the system to talk to them and say, help us, help me in, in my hour of need. And the system has told them to go away. And then they have done something which has made them end up in the criminal justice system. Now this is what worries me about um, our about this delinked from mental disorder, risk-based detention. What you're in danger of doing is criminalizing people, is putting them at risk of preventive detention. Um, uh, when really what people want is a mental health system which responds to their needs. Either we believe that the mental health system is there to uh, support people with mental health difficulties. Um, and to, you know, that's what everybody's being paid for. Uh, or we think well, we've got we we've got to delink uh, uh, any uh, compulsory intervention from uh, mental disorder, and governments are going to say there are all these risky people out there. Now, I agree with George. You know, you're much more at risk from somebody who is uh, between the ages of uh, 17 and 25, and who's a heavy drinker, uh, or who likes crack cocaine. Uh, than you are maybe, but we don't preventatively detain. If we catch them with crack cocaine, we may lock them up. But we won't lock them up if they're a, an alcoholic until they've really done something criminal. And you know, that is a discrimination. I'm not arguing against that. But what we need to do is have some kind of system of rights protection. What might that look like? Dutch advocacy system. And those advocates um, have had a duty uh, to see everybody who is in the hospital, whether they are detained or not. Um, and uh, if the person mm, spoke to them, they had a confidential duty not to say, uh, if, if the person said, don't tell the hospital what I've told you, they had a confidential duty not to tell that, even if the person said, I'm going to escape. Now there's a a radical idea. I was quite shocked by this because I was kind of brought up in the best interests tradition and I thought, well, you know, this is not in the best interest of the person. But then you think, well, there's all these other people in the hospital who are supposed to be looking out for best interests. And um, what, what's the advocate there for? The advocate's there to look at wishes and feelings, preferences and so on. Um, now, um, what's this is different to what Rory is doing, which is, to my mind, peer 
uh, although you might not be allowed to call it that, that's what it is, uh, peer advocacy where you're supporting somebody and you would feel impelled maybe <coughs> if you thought they were at risk you'd have to, have to tell somebody. But you know, that's one possibility. Another possibility is um, to have uh, proper inspectoral bodies which inspect places on the basis of unannounced visiting instead of the pre-announced set piece. I don't know if you have that in Ireland, you probably do. But that's vitally important if you're going to find out what's going on in hospitals. And you also need strong service user representation. And you also need a system where if a person is objecting to being in a place, you can find out about that. That there, this notion that somebody can be persistently trying to leave and still be classified as a voluntary patient is, a, is an affront to common sense. Um, you know, it just, it, it isn't realistic. Uh, now, one way you could get round that is by, by doing what we've done and say these people are all informal patients, they're not voluntary patients, but you don't want to do that, and that would be radically off-message if I were to, to say that. But I don't think that's what is, is envisaged here. But the one thing I would say is that what we need is proper safeguards. We don't necessarily... Um, Having two lots of le pieces of legislation means you immediately create a problem of an interface between those two bits of legislation. Northern Ireland are trying to adopt single track legislation um, uh, based on a similar kind of idea of incapacity as, uh, as, as George has put up on his slides with this idea of, um, uh, of you're incapable if you're unable to uh, w weigh information in the balance or appreciate it. Um, now that's where subjective judgment comes in in the assessment of capacity. What do we mean by appreciate? What do we mean by weigh? Um, and if we adopt a best interests approach to detention, um, which is what essentially we um, have uh, under the Mental Capacity Act, um, sort of best interests and in prevention of harm to the person. Um, you, you, there are dangers um, in that, in uh, that particularly the way best interests are, are worked out in England and Wales does not respect the wishes and preferences of the person. It requires that regard be paid to them. Um, uh, but, and it also talks about past and present wishes and feelings. We had a case recently where a lady um, with a young woman with anorexia who, uh, whose current wishes and feelings were that she wanted to die and she wanted to stay on the what we call the Liverpool Care Pathway, which is palliative care, increasing doses of morphine. She, that's what she currently wanted, but the judge decided that the wishes and feelings of hers which carried more weight were what her wishes and feelings were some years previously when she'd been a medical student um, with a boyfriend and, uh, ha and a more optimistic outlook on life. Th those were the wishes and feelings that were um, uh, more, more relevant. Rights based legislation is good but we have to realise the reality of any mental health legislation and indeed any mental capacity legislation. It is this, that rights follow clinical power. Clinical power comes first, the power to detain, the power to treat without consent, the power to make decisions on somebody else's behalf. What uh, one French philosopher called tutelary power the power to uh, act as a sort of tutor over somebody else. And rights come second to that. That's always been the dynamic of healthcare law. And we have to make sure that rights get a fair crack of the whip in this, uh, in this arrangement. You, know, you, you have a right to challenge clinical decisions. 
you um, have a right to argue that you're no longer mentally disordered and you don't need to be, uh, or your mental disorder isn't severe enough for you to need to be in hospital. Um, but uh, the CRPD is saying we need to get rid of mental health law altogether. I think this is a long way in the future. Um, I, I, I may be saying something which is not acceptable um, uh, to, to a lot of people, but I think it's, a, it, it's still a good way off. And if I see it in my lifetime, I will be um, thinking we've moved a long way. Um, what I will say is I think Amnesty has done a fantastic amount of excellent work in this area over the 10 year period that it has been involved in it. It has uh, really uh, upped the profile of service user involvement and service user rights in mental health law in Ireland and for that it is to be heartily congratulated. And it is also to be regretted, I think, that that work may have to be uh, tapered down. Um, uh, but but uh, a, a wholehearted, um, massive round of applause for what Amnesty has done uh, so far. So here you are. Amnesty.